Fabulous. So good afternoon, folks, and uh, and welcome again to a to a webinar with our Gopala Krishnan sir. Uh, uh, Gopal sir has has graced uh, two previous uh, Marcellus webinars to great success. Those webinars have gone on to become roaring successes on on YouTube. Uh, as we'll discuss shortly, he's the author of several books. Uh, which have which have played a big role in in the development of Marcellus's research. Our analyst. So let me do a a full introduction to to Gopal sir. But before that, welcome to welcome to Marcellus's webinar, uh, Mr. Gopala Krishnan. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be on your show again. Fantastic. So 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 for those uh, who haven't uh, uh, joined us in our preceding webinars with our Gopala Krishnan. He's a, he's a corporate leader of 55 years in, in prestigious private sector firms. Uh, let me break that up a little bit. 31 years in Unilever and 17 years in, in the Tata Sons Empire. He studied physics in Kolkata University, uh, uh, engineering at IIT Kharagpur, and then attended the advanced management program at, at HBS. Uh, he's been, uh, and then in 1967, late 60s, swinging 60s, he entered the world of, of uh, professional management. He served as the chairman of Unilever Arabia, the MD of Brookbond Lipton, and then the vice chairman of Hindustan Unilever. Uh, he went on to become director of Tata Sons and of several, several Tata companies. Currently, he serves as an independent director and non-executive chairman of Castrol India, and also as the independent director of uh, Press Trust of India, another iconoclastic institution. We're going to discuss a lot of what we'll discuss this evening is from his books. He's written several books. Uh, 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 part of this is uh, many of these are part of what's called the the Shaper series. Uh, the Shaper series, you might remember, folks we've discussed some of these books before. Uh, they include one on uh, Kotak, how their Kotak built a valuable Indian bank. Uh, he's written a book on TCS. Shaper series has a book on TCS, how TCS built an uh, HDFC, how Deepak Parekh grew HDFC group exponentially. Uh, another one on Mariko, how Harsh Mariwala grew Mariko. But distinct from the Shaper series, Gopal sir has also written uh, several other books which have gone on to sell very well. In 2015, he wrote, wrote a book called What the CEO Wants, What the CEO Really Wants from You, The Four A's for Managerial Success. Uh, then another book called Six Lenses, Vignettes of Success, Career and Relationships. Uh, uh, in 2017 came a biography of innovations from birth to maturity. Uh, and then uh, 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 more recently, in 2021, uh, he wrote a book called Pivots for Career Success, Unleashing People Power. So thank you very much, Kupal, sir, for joining us. It's a webinar many people have looked forward to. It's a webinar that has actually been demanded by several people since you last graced uh, Marcellus's webinar, I think, one and a half years ago. So let me hand over to my colleague. Let me hand over to my colleague, Salil Desai, for a few questions. Uh, as usual, folks, at the half an hour mark, we will take your questions. Please fire in as many of your questions as you can. Uh, please fire in as many of your questions as you can. Uh, uh, and we'll try to take them in the second half of this one hour webinar with, with our Gopala Krishna. Saril, over to you. Yes, thank you, Saurav. Uh, so folks, uh, good evening, right? Today, uh, the, the subject of our discussion is going to be uh, what uh, what we call as she companies, uh, right? Or rather what uh, Gopal Krishnan sir calls as she companies, right? These are sustainable, honest, and enlightened enterprises. Right? Now, this is a term which uh, I'm sure not of not all of us have uh, heard in the past. Uh, so first we'll kick off, sir, with, uh, you know, with what is really a she company? You know, how do we identify what is a she company? Uh, you know, are there any common traits that we can look for? Uh, you know, uh, and is there, a, is there a something which stands out in a she company? Thanks, Salil and uh, Saurabh. Uh, I'm glad we are starting with the definition because I'm off late, become almost uh, infatuated, if not passionate, about this so-called she company, which stands for sustainable, honest, enlightened companies. Uh, if you're cynical, you would say, "Hey, how can a private, how can a company, a capitalist company, be?" sustainable, honest, and enterprising. Just read the morning newspaper and you figure out it's a tautology. It doesn't work. But I do believe that uh, just like good human beings are possible, everybody is not a murderer or a rapist or whatever. You read about bad things. Great companies are possible. And I've been researching this subject 
and its various aspects for over three or four years. And as Saurabh mentioned, wrote a book on it. Uh, the question that I ask myself is, is there a perfectly sustainable, perfectly honest, perfectly enlightened capitalist company? And I very quickly came to the conclusion it is as likely that you'll encounter such a company as you'll encounter the perfect human being or the perfect leader. It doesn't exist. So my definition of a she company is a company that is on a journey to become better year after year in sustainability, honesty and enlightenment and improving 1%, 2% year after year, over 30 years, 40 years, they will asymptotically reach what Saurabh and you are very fond of talking about, the compound effect. Uh, but you are never at 100%, you know, you are maybe 96, 97, and therefore their aberrations will show periodically by some bad newspaper report, some uh, uh, inquiry into some aspect. And being fallible, they will even make a genuine mistake for which they will make up and uh, admit it and pay. So, uh, creating a she company is as difficult as creating uh, a very good human being. You don't have to be Ramana Maharishi or Ramakrishna Paramananda or uh, Swami Vivekananda. Even you and I can be very good human beings. And likewise, uh, you don't have to be uh, iconic. For the last 200 years, you may be iconic, you may not be. So there are semblances and appurtenances of becoming a she company. And the six books that we have written, I have co-authors, by the way. Uh, to be fair, I should mention each book has a co-author. They are different co-authors. All the faculty from the SPJ Institute of Management and Research. We said we are looking at companies which have the potential to be declared she. If such a declaration is required, they won all the ET awards and BS awards and all that stuff. Uh, but just like you never declare a, perf uh, a human being as a perfect human being, you don't declare a company as she, even Tata or Godrej, Bajaj. These are very, very iconic companies. None of them is perfect. And their heads will not say they are perfect. So my infatuation is with she companies. Another way to call them is business institution. And the people who shape such companies, I call shapers. So India desperately needs, desperately, I use the word desperate, not just badly needs or could do with uh, shapers. That's a couple of notches above a leader. You know, people make the distinction between a manager and a leader. I'm making a distinction between the leader and a shaper. Very few leaders are shapers and the passage of time shows. And the mark, I suppose, for whether you're a shaper or a leader is whether you're able to create a business institution or take all the steps required to create a business institution. So, um, sorry, it's a bit of a long answer, but I thought it was uh, required for you to understand and for my audience, my distinguished audience, to appreciate that I'm not just talking of great companies. In fact, <laughs> sorry, I might appear a bit cynical, but those who won the awards in the big papers are probably not the she companies. Yeah. And, and those who are written about every morning in the stock market as having moved it by, or those whose CEOs are very high profile, uh, they may not be the she companies. Uh, occasionally they could be. So I hope uh, uh, the she companies tend to be boring, <laughs> steady, uh, not volatile, uncertain, and enigmatic. So that is an important sort of, uh, it's not necessary, but it is a sufficient condition to be a she company. I mean, if you look at Hindustan Lever, if you look at HDFC, if you look at Kotak Bank, uh, you look at TCS, uh, a cynical person can say they don't make the news, they don't move the nifty every week or every day. Uh, and I say thank God for it. <laughs> it's probably a good mark of a she company. Right. Understood. So, so thanks. So, thanks. So, so on yeah. that, if I could just drop a quick anecdote here. So so often when I when I'm uh, you know sort of addressing large ga gatherings of Marcellus clients or potential clients, 
uh, I tend to sort of do a small quiz because, uh, you know, we keep getting told, uh, Gopal sir, we keep getting told that, uh, you know, Marcellus buys these stocks which are really expensive on PE multiples. So I, so I got intrigued about this for a while. So, so I do a small quiz. For example, I ask them that, look, uh, uh, HDFC Bank has created 70x shareholder value in the last 20 years. It's not mind-blowing. 70x shareholder value in 20 years is pretty solid. Uh, does anybody know the name of the CEO of HDFC Bank, right? And I ask this in sort of gatherings of uh, well-educated, wealthy Indians in, in various big cities in our country. Uh, similarly, I'll ask, does anybody know the name of the CEO of, uh, of uh, TCS or the CEO of uh, Asian Paints, right? Um, or the CEO of Titan. Right? These are all companies that have that have created enormous wealth shareholder value at a consistent rate over the last 10 years, 20 years. And even I am astonished, uh, uh, Gopala Krishnan sir, even I am astonished as to even amongst the Indian elite, right? barely one out of 100 people will know the names of the CEOs of, of these firms. If on the other hand, um, I asked them, I asked people the names for uh, of names of uh, CEOs of promoters of companies that are not she companies, that are that are basically more standard, uh, standard issue, uh, sadak chap companies. Uh, most people would know the names of the of the CEOs of such companies, and it's a really paradoxical situation. The one that you mentioned that award nahi milta. The, the, the she companies neither crave publicity nor get awards, uh, and yet they metronomically create. They create wealth for shareholders. They create jobs for the for people. They create GDP growth for the country, and they shape society, shape society in the context of your shaper series. But the CEOs of these companies are often utterly unknown, even in the context of the Indian elite. Back to you, Salil. Right. Uh, so you know, let's uh, kind of dive a little deeper into one aspect that you mentioned: is that India desperately needs. Uh, she companies, right? So now, from both say society or the economy, uh, economy's point of view, uh, and an investor's point of view, some of uh, people here will be investors. You know, why should they care? We, why do we need she companies and that too desperately? You know, um, in any society, this is a slightly philosophical point, but I think you relate to it uh, yeah. very easily because I'm, I'm, I've done it in terms which I understand, which I have experienced. And I'm not a philosopher, so I'm sure all of you will also appreciate. I think of a society, think of India as a society, you know, uh, as having three layers, okay? There is an inner layer, think of it in concentric circles. There is a middle layer, there's an outer layer, just to make it simple. Yeah. The inner layer, I call them the three E's. The innermost layer I call enterprise. In the old days, it used to be trading and Katsi Bhatias went out for shipping and the Chittiyas went to Burma. And, uh, you know, we know the story and I don't have to spend time on that. If you don't have... And that enterprise has now become industrial and then become services, you know. So, enterprise is at the heart of a society. Family-managed businesses are a very important part of enterprise. People don't realize that if you look at the statistics of the MSME department, India has 63 million enterprises. My definition of an enterprise is it may be a one-man, it may be a five-man pop and mom show, it may be a reliance, you know, all of them are enterprises. If 63 million is probably employing, I don't know, uh, maybe 200 million people, you know, it's a very important part of the economy. They generate the tax. They generate the revenues. Some of them may be crooked, but it's not fair to paint all of them as crooked. And if we keep announcing every month that the GST has gone up from 90,000 to 100,000 to 150,000, very rarely do we doff the cap that people are willingly paying taxes, right? Honestly paying taxes. Um, the second layer after the enterprise layer is. I call it education, for lack of a better word. By education, I not only mean, you know, primary, secondary education, but I mean culture. You know, um, a society needs nurturing. It needs nourishment. And I include drama, music, poetry, 
PhDs, MSc, everything in, in the word education because it nourishes the human heart and the human mind. Okay. I even include sports in that category, by the way, because it gives people pleasure and uh, shows skills. And the third and the last uh, uh, circle that we are talking about, I call eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is a Greek word, which means anand. It's satisfying life. Okay. So there is enterprise at the core. There is education in the middle and eudaimonia. And if you read Greek philosophy or Hindu philosophy for that matter, you will find variations of this. Now, in the old days, if I look at the Chola Raj, if I look at the Sangha Mira in Tamil Nadu, uh, people realized this and traders were encouraged. They, today also, we, we, today we have an ambivalent attitude to traders. Some people think it's good. Some people think, yeah, but bunch of crooks, be careful with them. Other people think the stock market is one big manipulation and manipulators like Marcellus are sitting there <laughs> and massaging the whole thing. And while it may be unfair in the case of Marcellus, there are other people whose names may start with A, B, C, D, whatever, who are definitely doing that. So they are not entirely wrong, but they are not entirely right either. I therefore think that uh, if a society can be likened to a motor car, then in the petrol tank, in the petrol is enterprise. If that doesn't fire, there is no point having a fancy gearbox and shock absorbers and seats and Wi-Fi and internet inside the car. And that's why I consider it India desperately needs because in 75 years, in 75 years, nobody is talk, talking about, not, I should say nobody, very few people talk about it. We have created only, I think, 19,000 companies, if my memory serves me right, of the last statistic I saw, with a turnover more than 10 crores. Turnover. Of the 19,000, I think four or 5,000 are listed on the stock exchange, Bombay or NSE. You know that number better, but it's of that order. <laughs> if you carry on with this Pareto principle, there are 20 guys, as your own research has shown, there are 20, 25 guys who account for 70-80% uh, of the increment. So we are a land of pygmies in enterprise with one or two giants. And no nation has advanced with that. We need to find a solution to this. But that's the reason why I use the word desperately need. That's I think you, you, yeah. you have done so Thank much you. research in Marcellus. Uh, you would agree with me and maybe you could add a word or two uh, in case some of my numbers are wrong. or my I don't think my perspective so, so, is wrong. So why don't I do this? Uh, yeah, I can project. I'll project on the screen, right? The research on this subject that we have done. And uh, Gopal sir is absolutely right. What we have created in India, what we have built in India is a, is a super polarized economy. An economy gradually in which smaller companies are finding it harder and harder to, 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 uh, to, to forget, make money just to survive is becoming a challenge. So back in December, this is on the Marcellus website, folks. It's uh, free to access marcellus.in contains all our research. If anybody wants to be put on our mailing list, just uh, email any of us say Saurabh at marcellus.in or Salil at marcellus.in will put you on our, on our mailing list. So back in December, we published the, the annual update of this research, which we've been publishing for seven, se several years, which is uh, the, the percentage of the Nifty, uh, the percentage of Nifty accounted, uh, the percentage of, uh, of profits accounted for by, by the 20 uh, largest companies. So if you, I'm sorry, uh, hit the wrong screen. If, uh, yeah, if you see here, if you see here, the uh, on the screen in front of you are uh, the, the companies that have driven 80% uh, of wealth creation in the Nifty. So these are the names of the companies that have driven 80% of wealth creation in the Nifty in the decade ending 31st March 2022. So just to sort of back up a little bit, in that 10-year period ending March 20, 2022, the Nifty created 105 trillion rupees of wealth. Out of that 105 trillion, 84 trillion came from these uh, gi these giant companies whose names that you see here, right? 80 uh, out of that 105 trillion, 84 trillion came from these giant companies, um, and you know these are familiar names to many many Indians, right? So this is the these are the top 20 wealth creators. Uh, 20 giant companies created 84 trillion out of the 105 trillion of 
wealth created and if you carry on further on this uh, and on this blog on our website so in case any of you are interested it's on our website the name of the blog is winner takes all in india's new improved economy it was published on 24th december so right at the end of that blog are these four tables which sort of are a sort of breathtaking read about how how utterly dominant uh, uh, 20 large companies are um, and the last table in the uh, uh, the last table in the blog uh, uh, sorry the penultimate table the penultimate table in the blog are the top profit generators in india right so the penultimate table so 20 companies the 20 largest profit generators in India uh, in the year ending March 2022, they accounted for around 50% of India's uh, profits, right? But if you take a three year average, if you take a three year average 2020, 2021, 2022, these 20 giant companies have ended up accounting for, for around 70% of India's profits. So, so two separate lists to focus on. One is the list of the 20 largest wealth creators. Here's the list of the 20 largest wealth creators, 20 giant companies accounting for 84 trillion. It's a staggering amount of money. That's well over a, a trillion dollars. 20 companies that created over more than a trillion dollars of wealth in the decade ending March 2022. And a separate list of the 20 largest uh, profit generators. Again, a highly concentrated list of, of giant companies who account for 50-60% of India's profits. So, so the point you've made is fair that we've created a society where we've created an economy rather where profit and wealth concentration is, is becoming very extreme. Um, and in that context, the, 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 the she company becomes that much more relevant, sustainable, honest enterprises. Back to you, can, I, can, I, can I add a small point to what you just said? Yes, sir. Uh, in uh, response to Salil's question, why are you wanting them desperately? And capital D for that. I have read a statistic, which perhaps is your own... Uh, blog or website for all I know. If I'm quoting you, then credit to you. That at the time of independence, um, I think 13% of the net profits of companies came from 20 companies. By the time of liberalization, it became 40%. And today, it is 75%. There are some such statistics. In other words, it is not only concentrated, but it's concentrating yeah. further. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I really fear that in 2030 or whenever we are a 5 trillion or 10 trillion economy, there'll be two companies <laughs> accounting for everything. And the reaction to such a possibility is something that you see played out in the newspaper also. But continue, please continue. And in a way, uh, Korea, Korea is in power of Korea. Five companies run Korea, right? And Korea is exactly. not a very leading country. So 15 conglomerates run Japan. So, yeah. so there are other free markets which have become incredibly concentrated, Korea being the one of the most extreme manifestations of that. Right. Uh, uh, sir, you know, the 63 million enterprises that that uh, that exist in India right now, they're all there to uh, make a living, right? support their families. Right? Uh, they're all after what you can call the profit motive. Right now, in a capitalistic uh, world, a society, right? Uh, how do we balance having a she company, which is thinking of, you know, uh, a lot of nice things, steady, stayed, uh, boring companies, uh, versus somebody who is actually in an active pursuit of profit. Are these two kind of inherently balanceable? You know, on the face of it, they look contradictory. And if you said enlightened capitalism, uh, it, it does sound odd to, uh, especially if you're a left-leaning uh, Marxist or somebody, you know. But uh, as I said, I've been studying this subject. There's a very fine book I recommend you to read. It's a little expensive, but worth the read called Enlightened Capitalist by Jim O'Toole, an old friend of mine. Uh, and in my case, specifically, I find that uh, I worked in Unilever and I worked in Tata. And so I have a ready crucible, apart from reading other people's commentaries and books. There are lots of similarities between Unilever and Tata. Don't forget that these were also startups. When our great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather was a young man, uh, Tata started up in 1868 and um, I think uh, Unilever is about the same time, plus minus a bit, you know. Uh, both of them created townships. One was Jamshedpur, one was uh, Port Sunlight. Both of them created huge businesses which developed the national economy, one of Britain, one of India. 
Uh, both of them believed very strongly in an egalitarian society that workers must be taken care of, that if you reward your workers, your community around you, you know, suppliers and everybody, then the company's profits will take care of. Both of them believed, I mean, these are similarities, both of them believed that uh, their wealth should go to a foundation or a trust. And both of them had set those in motion. So I believe that enlightened capitalism uh, can come to, but in the study of companies, I find that the enlightenment vanishes after the first founder or founder plus one or founder plus two. You know, the capitalists uh, or the money bags or the fintech types take over or the merchant bankers or the investment bankers. And they say the purpose of business is to make profit. So the enlightenment vanishes, the capitalist word stays. If I take Unilever, uh, the founder was removed as a chairman by the board. And uh, the person who took over was a guy called DRC Cooper. What do you think his background was? He was an accountant and an economist. And what do you think he did? <laughs> he just reorientated the company, not to become a money bags or an unprincipled company, I must add. But uh, what Chamsaji Tata did, on the other hand, was to institutionalize enlightenment. I think Bajaj has also done that. I think Godrej has also done that. Now, you can talk of institutionalizing enlightenment if that group or that company or that corporation has been around for 100 years. But you can see many who have dropped off the radar screen. GE is a great example. Lincoln Electric, on the other hand, much less heard of, has institutionalized it. Cadbury was started by round trees, uh, by uh, Quakers, you know, round trees at Cadbury. Uh, Hershey's was started by people with very laudable things. Uh, but uh, somewhere down the line, they have also changed due to acquisitions, liquidation, whatever, whatever. So I think it's very important that when you bring, up, bring forth a baby, you may be from a middle class family in Dharavi or a lower class family in Dharavi. Or you may be living in Carmichael Road in the world's most expensive apartment. As a parent, <laughs> your intention is that your child should grow up to be a responsible, earning member and contributing to society. I don't think that Arman is different. And that's what I would like India's entrepreneurs to be. And that requires long-term and persistent pursuit of enlightenment. Accepting that you're going to make mistakes and correcting it as you go along. Rather than what happens in the uh, financial world, you make one mistake, to correct that mistake, you make another mistake, another trade, and then, you know, you suddenly, like Nick Leeson in, uh, uh, was it Bearings? I forgot. Bearings. Yes, yes, Bearings. Yeah? Uh, you just find yourself in a hor horrible mess. I mean, you look at what's happening to Credit Suisse now, you know, uh, and many banks. Uh, I don't know, take everybody's names, but uh, one mistake leads to another. So I think the people who make enlightened capitalism possible are very valuable. So there is a manager, there is a leader, there is a even higher level of a she, she one, if I might call it. But a she two is really outstanding yeah. and they're very, very rare. I include Jamshedji Tata uh, as one of them. And that's why yeah. I believe that Jamshedji Tata is probably the greatest industrial leader India has ever had because he has managed to institutionalize it. Now, you may say after 50 years when there is not a Tata in charge, will it change? I don't know. I'm not an astrologer. Right. But I think there's a ladder to be climbed and you're never there. And you're always striving to see if you can get your foot onto the next ladder. And I would like to believe that if you reward people for their enlightened capitalism, which is what we've tried to do in the research we did at these six books. By the way, they, there are more than six companies. We just, we, you know, zeroed in on six. I don't want to give the impression there are only six in this whole country. It is just that I wrote to 10 CEOs and six of them agreed and then we got ahead with the research. But you mentioned names like uh, Asian Paints, uh, Pidilite. Uh, they're wonderful companies. Titan, we have not written about these companies. And I'm sure you can rattle off uh, from your own research. The thing I like about your research and our research is one is the left hand and one is the right hand. <laughs> Marcellus comes at it from an analytical perspective. You, you know, beat the hell out of the numbers. 
uh, until you get to the third decimal place and then you arrive at a conclusion. Whereas uh, that's the left hand and that's an important part. The right hand says, what are the behaviors? What are the mindsets of these people? It's more qualitative. And if you're looking for a match for your daughter or sister, you would not only look at the fellow's income in a company, <laughs> you'll also say, Iska, Yavahar kaisa hai? So I think if, if these two ideas can be melded together, um, I hope someday somebody will write a book on good to great in the Indian context. Not necessarily only about Tata and Godrej, by the way. Some of these companies you might uh, hit upon and say these are showing all the right signs. Right. right. That's interesting. So uh, people will just take one more question. Uh, I'll just ask one more question and then we'll uh, we'll open this floor to everybody who's on the call. So please put in your question in the Q&A box and, uh, uh, you know, don't lose out on on this great opportunity to to learn or share in the wisdom of uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan. Uh, so one last question is on, uh, again, you know, if we go back to, let's say, Jamshedji Tata, right? Now, how much of uh, a she company's uh, uh, existence or foundation is the result of uh, an individual, right? Uh, uh, can can say a second generation take over and then figure out if they want to build a sustainable, honest, uh, enlightened enterprise, or is it very very person dependent? Well, the, the, when you look at the market uh, again, using the market uh, metaphor, many companies it is with the founder or founder plus one. And then they become quote unquote normal companies, uh, so to say, you know. Uh, but there are exceptions. And Jamshedji or Tata is one exception. Although I have not studied Bajaj and Godrej, I'd like to believe that they are likely to be exceptions also. If you look at the founder, Ardeshit, Birosha, Godrej, uh, mm -hmm. and his uh, progeny. And the, to find that very, you know, everybody is not a, is not a, uh, is not a uh, uh, federal. But you have to celebrate not only Federer and Nadal and Djokovic, you have to celebrate many others who are also there. Uh, what is it that makes uh, she, we have discussed, uh, you know, I told you there are certain characteristics that they have, but what institutionalized she is very different. There is a very core philosophy of that company. It actually has a philosophy. The philosophy is so simple that like Jesus got or Buddha got an awakening, uh, it can be put on a tablet of stone. Like Moses got the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is uh, pretty simple. Um, Muhammad dictated the Quran or rattled off the Quran. It's a very simple thing. But then it goes on into mythologies. You know, you get Hadith and you get... Uh, stories and anecdotes. Krishna said this and Yudhishthira said that and all those things. And then finally you get rituals where you go to the temple and the priest is always ringing the bell and telling you not to do this and not to do that. So there is philosophy, there is mythology and rituals. Now the distinctive feature about Tatas I am talking, I am not saying everybody should do this, is if you go to any Tata outfit, you will find a statue or a picture of Jamshedji Tata. On the 3rd of March or his birth anniversary, you will find them putting a garland around it. There will be some speeching. Lala's book, uh, you know, the creation of wealth and the philosophy of Tata is given to him. When I joined as a new entrant, in, I was already 52 and a bit cynical, I have to add, when you're 52. But I was given the book. I said, please read about what is our philosophy and what are the mythologies around it. Harish Bhatt keeps writing stories about, uh, uh, those are mythologies. I'm not saying they are myths, they are mythologies. How was the Taj created? Jamshedji got kicked out of the Watson Hotel and he said, I'll set up. So these things create uh, an image of a company. But you go to Unilever, you will not find the statue of William Heskett Lever anywhere. Now, this is maybe a very peculiar Indian thing. I don't know. But I have to say that if you want to have a she company, you must have a philosophy which the founder can implement and maybe he'll impart it to his son. But to institutionalize it, you must have the mythologies and the rituals. Many of our companies don't think in those terms. Since I've been very fortunate to work in both Unilever and here, I mean, Unilever hasn't become a rank capitalist. I mean, Paul Polman has been talking about sustainability to the point where it's actually, <laughs> he, he was criticized. Uh, Alan Job is being also criticized, the current CEO. 
So the values are still there. They may not have all those mythologies that Tata's have. But uh, I think the most valuable thing for India, and I think we have a starting list of Tata and maybe Bajaj and Godrich. I can't readily think of any more, but I'm sure there would be. Uh, it's just that it's not coming to my mind right now. Where you can say we have live examples in our country of people who have created what uh, Jamnalal Bajaj did, what we did with Gandhi. You know, there are lots of terrific stories you'll find in Bar Bar both Godrej and uh, Bajaj. And I think that's what's really uh, the end goal I have before I am called to order to God's kingdom. <laughs> If I'm sitting in the waiting room, this is what is occupying me and I feel very passionately about it. Oh, absolutely, a worthy cause sir, to be to be passionate about. Uh, I think the questions are coming in uh, fast. Saurabh, if you could please help us uh, take some questions from the audience. So let's let's start with the, the, the obvious one, right? Uh, so, so Gopal sir, lots of people ask us this question. Uh, in fact, even my my uh, retired parents in, in the UK asked me this question. So in a country where crony capitalism is so obviously successful, like Gopal sir, in a country where crony capitalism is so obviously successful, uh, a lot of Indians, both in India, outside India, a lot of our clients, people on this call want to know what incentive does anybody have to create a she company? If you can, uh, if you can sort of crony capitalize your way to the top of the ladder, uh, you know, in say a generation or so. Uh, uh, so, you know, what what answer should we give? Give not just to youngsters, but even people like my parents, who, who sort of question why why you know I live in India, work in India, in a in a system which is so visibly dominated by crony capitalists. You know, crony capitalism is an evolutionary process. Okay, I mean. Uh... If you talk to an anthropologist, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, if you talk to an anthropologist, he will probably tell you that we had more hair on our face, or our face was longer, or our shoulders were drooping so many million years ago when our ancestors left Africa. Crony capitalism is a face. Unfortunately, its shadow stays. You said, why should a person not resort to that? It's like saying, if alcohol is available, why should I not drink myself to death? Yeah, you right. can. And there are people who do that. If drugs are freely available and I can afford it, why should I not have drugs every day? You can have it. But we are not talking of that person. We are talking of people who understand the value of delayed, uh, uh, what do you call it? Delayed uh, entitlement, you know. Uh, if you're looking for immediate gratification, then you go that route. But the, one of the characteristics of a she, Shepa, is he is looking for uh, delayed gratification. You know that famous psychology study that kids were given some. The the yeah, yeah, study, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I would like to see more delayed gratification entrepreneurs in India rather than those who want a valuation of a billion dollars in one and a half years and uh, cash out. I mean, they are all smart guys. I'm not criticizing them. But we need the guys. There are some companies which uh, even you may not have heard of, which are listed companies, uh, which nobody's heard of. But they are building. There's a company called Scient, C Y I E N T. It's a software engineering company. I have heard very good reports about them. They are probably less than $2 billion in uh, market cap now. My memory serves me right. There's a company called Galaxy Surfactants, which is an old, boring chemical company. Um, they are also fairly uh, well-run companies. And I think I would like to see many more of those, both written about and invested in. So, so we have many of these old, boring companies in our small and mid-cap portfolios. So let's go to Mr. G.D. Bhatia's questions. Uh, so, Gopal, so Mr. Bhatia is clearly a pragmatic man. He's making, asking a very sensible question. He's saying, as an investor, I'm interested in good returns on my investments, right? He wants good returns on his investments. He's asking, how can a she company contribute in this goal of Mr. Bhatia making good returns on his investments? Yeah, there is a, uh, I would say to Mr. Bhatia, she companies also generate good returns. 
None of the companies we have talked about deliver bad returns. If you look at the list that you produced of the top 20 companies, all of them are not she companies, not yet anyway. But many of them are she companies. So trying to be good in your studies and also good in sports is an ambition every young person has for his, every person has for his child. So Mr. Bhatia, I would request you to consider that she companies are not people with lousy returns. What is Hindustan Lever doing there? What is TCS doing there? What is Infosys doing there? What is Kotak Bank doing in that list? What is HDFC doing in that list? They are she companies. So you have to go by the numbers that Saurabh and Salil produce and look at their TSR uh, since that is one metric that you choose and uh, see whether that suits you. Please invest your money there. So just to buttress uh, Gopal Sir's point, uh, let me take a she company that we have written about in in our books and written about in our in our blogs. It's a she company based in Kalina in Mumbai. It's called Asian Paints. Uh, returns are as follows. Uh, it IPO'd in 1982. So 10x in the last 10 years, 100x in the last 20 years, something like 1000x in the last 30 years. And here comes the catch. So stupidly, I used to just add another zero. I used to say 1000x in 30 years, so 10,000x in 40 years. Hoga. The answer is it's not 10,000x in 40 years. It's 23,000x in 40 years. Right, that's the power of she. Right, that's the power of compounding. That's the power of compounding. Also, power of... so so if you want to, and this is a point. I think I'm glad Mr. Bhatia raised this point. It's a point not just to Mr. Bhatia. For all the people out there who get very you know worried, Marcellus uh, she companies me paisa laga raha hai. Uh, how will these poor she's compete with the crony capitalist? Uh, our answer is simple. Uh, companies who do the right thing for the country do the right thing for their employees, for their customers, uh, uh, typically end up doing the right thing for their shareholders. And you and I emerged from that uh, with, a, with our wealth nicely fortified. Uh, uh, we'll move further on. Uh, Saril, if, is there, if there's any specific question you would like to take, just, just uh, uh, go for it. Uh, I'll, I'll choose a few which are sort of leaping out in their, in their clarity of thought. So Mudit Jainji asks, uh, Gopal sir, uh, Mudit Jainji asks, is there a country, is there any country where you've lived, worked in, you heard about, which provides a great ecosystem for she companies? You know, I don't think uh, Mudit Bhai, I know Mudit well, and he always asks very uh, relevant and pertinent questions. Uh, I don't think it's to do with the country. It is to do with the people in the country. You know, Mudit Bhai's question, I don't want to interpret. Are there, is there any place in the world which allows honest people to survive? <laughs> I, I think every company allows honest people to survive. If honest people want to be honest and survive. I mean, you have companies in India which have not got any controversy. And you have mentioned the names of some of them. Uh, they are not perfect. The Hindustan levers have developed multi-billion dollar businesses. The HDFCs have, the Asian Paints have. Not by giving backhanders, but they probably made a few errors and mistakes as they went along in the last 50, 70 years. So I don't think any particular ecosystem, but since we have a lot of literature in the Anglo-Saxon countries, the US and the UK, I can think of many companies, and but I don't want to applaud their environment as being better than ours. Look at 100 years ago when my grandfather was a young man, uh, I think uh, US was full of robber barons. So they had crony capitalism. So crony capitalism is not something you can wish away, you know. This is like saying, we've eliminated heart attacks. It won't happen. You may eliminate smallpox, but you can't eliminate heart attacks. Now, so nicely put, in a, in a world of sin and sorrow, as Charlie Munger would say, in a world characterized by sin and sorrow, we have to create she companies. Uh, sin and sorrow exist in every country. She companies, therefore, can, can exist in every country. Uh, Jaskamal Singh Ji asks uh, uh, Gopal sir, uh, he's saying basically is this about spirituality? Do we need a spiritual person on the board of uh, to create a, a she company, a spiritual well-educated person? Is that what's required on the board Gopal sir? No, I don't think it requires a spiritual person. I think it requires a sensible person. Uh, you know, today greed is good. You know, and uh, uh, what's that American film Greed is good or something. Right? There is such a film. Yeah. Um, Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street, yeah. Um, 
I think it just requires a philosophical realignment. Uh, if you, you don't want Swami Vivekananda and Ramakrishna Paramahamsa being chairman of companies. We have one company like that called Patanjali, but it's not necessarily <laughs> very she, you know. <laughs> it's got the appurtenances of spirituality, but I'm not sure it's anywhere near a she. It's probably a he company <laughs> where the H and the E are standing not for honest and uh, enlightened. I think it's to do with values. And I think my great, uh, uh, I'm very encouraged that, you know, deep in ourselves, though we may not be spiritual or uh, values based and the top of a hat, you can't quote in Sanskrit from Upanishads, you know, none of us, I, at least I'm not in that league. But in our, in, our, in our DNA, stories are embedded. And if you look at what Vedanta says, you look at what Upanishad said, as applicable to companies and corporate sector, it says if you want to run a great business, I'm not saying that Vedanta says this, but I'm extrapolating from what it says. You have to do only four things. And I think that's embedded in our minds. And just display them. What are those four things? Be self-aware. Second, Protect the resources that enable you to do your business. You know, ESG, SDG, everything comes into that. Third, serve other people, not yourself. And fourth, have compassion. If you read Vivekananda, you read Aurobindo, you read, depending on how metaphysical you want to get, you can go up the ladder to Ramana Maharishi or somebody. And they don't say this about business. They say this about life. Four things. And I would say to Jaspalji, can you not do this? Can I not do this? Be self-aware. And if you want to meditate for that, do meditation. If you want to go to the temple for that, go to the temple. That's up to you. Protect your resources. That doesn't require you to be spiritual. Serve other people. You listen to an American business guru telling you to serve customers better. <laughs> it's, it's natural. And lastly, deal with compassion. Look at these startups firing people left, right and center. That's not compassion. So, I think it's possible to combine these. And if you combine these and work at it, just like you raised your child to have good values, be fair in competition, you have on the pathway to creating a she-cup. I don't think you need to be spiritual. Salil, do you want to come in with ESG? Yeah, in fact, sir, you you just uh, you know it was on my mind that uh, you know is being a she company more than just uh, you know being ESG compliant because ESG seems to be all the uh, the rage today, and uh, every company, every investor is uh, asking questions around these. Uh, are these the same, uh, or is she company a kind of more broader uh, concept? See, a she company is doing SG, ESG, SDD to the resources with which it is working. So you will protect the trees. You will not burn or reduce progressively the burning of coal. But you'll also take care of your suppliers. Take care doesn't mean a paternalistic thing. Huh? You'll be fair. And when I say compassion, people say, oh, compassion, if you go and do performance appraisal of your colleagues with compassion, both of you will be shedding tears. That fellow will never get the message. I said, that's not compassion. Compassion means being objective and honest and telling him the truth. But can you rock the boat without sinking it? You know, anybody can rock the boat. Anybody can sink the boat, sorry. But can you rock it without sinking it? So that's compassion. So I do believe that. Uh, ESG++ is this four-point Indian philosophy wisdom that I think all of us have inherited and we'll have no difficulty in relating with those. If I was talking to a foreign audience, they may say it all sounds a bit fuddy daddy. But if I'm talking to an Indian audience, that's what my grandfather used to tell me will be the response of most people. Right, right. Uh, and so I, want to one... Give one, I want to give you one <laughs> example only, just by way of... I was on the board of Tata Chemicals. I was the vice chairman and this story goes back 10, 15 years. We were desperate at that time as a company to get a natural soda ash mine somewhere in the world. Because as you know, natural soda ash is not energy intensive and it comes out cheaper. You mine it. 
uh, we found a place in Tanzania. And the management was very excited and certainly I as a, one of the board members was very excited. We spent five, ten million dollars doing all the preliminary studies, environmental. And then somewhere down the line after sinking ten million dollars, Tanzanian government got very excited. We found that it hurts the habitat of something none of us had, at least I hadn't heard of. Something called a little flamingo. And of course, we all googled what's a little flamingo. And we said, listen, if it's really disturbing that, it's better to write off 10 million today than 200 million after 10 years, when the whole world will be against us. Now, people get into controversies. They buy coal mines in Australia, they buy something else, something else, and they become the greatest and the most rich and the most wealthy and all that stuff. But is it worth it? So we abandoned the project. We wrote off $10 million. That's what I mean by protect resources. Now, none of us was a sadhu. None of us was spiritual. But we just said, is halat pe kya karna chahiye? Better to get out now. So we got out. He, he company would have gone and bribed the living daylights out of the government's brain, sir. Exactly. Any other company <laughs> would have said, are 10 million you're writing off? You understand that's 800, uh, how much is 10 million? 80 crores? Yeah, I think so. No, is it 800? Yeah, 80 crores. 80 crores, yes. And Tata Chemicals, 80 crores is a lot of money in those days, even now. Amazing. Amazing. So Sanjay Chandraya Ji asks a very perceptive question. So he says that Gopal sir has mentioned companies like Tata, Godrej, Hindustani Lever, Bajaj, right? So he's saying that all these names that Gopal sir is taking, these are multi-generational family names, right? Um, is it, are there any examples of first generation entrepreneurs in India building she companies, Gopal sir? Uh, if so, could you suggest a couple to Sanjay Chandraya Ji? Why couple? I wrote, we researched six and wrote six books. Sanjay ji, please read Mariko. Please read Kotak Mahindra Bank. Please read HDFC. Please read DCS. Please read Biocon. None of these companies existed when I began my career. And Robert Clive wasn't walking around Calcutta when I began my career, though I look like that. <laughs> okay. I began my career 55 years ago. These companies didn't exist. Or they were unknown, totally unknown. You would not even know where their office is. And they're first generation. First generation in the sense, I'm counting 50 years as a generation. They might have had multiple CEOs. So, Sanjay ji, there are definitely examples. And some of the other names we talked about, like Scient, uh, like uh, Galaxy. So, Galaxy, Galaxy factors. There are a few more I've got on my list. Totally unknown. Uh, but uh, there are many. So, Hamare Jaise bhi both hai, Hamare Buzur bhi both hai. Just like it's in the city where you live. Right. Uh, so, Pranav Parik has a comment for us. Uh, Abhayas, I mean, the folks said Marcellus. So, he's, uh, Pranav Parik is, I guess, saying that, look, Marcellus, you're, you're using terms like uh, winner takes all, winner takes all. He's saying, aren't these demotivating for young individuals which have a spark, who have a spark inside them to make it big? Wouldn't such individuals be pushed to thinking about the significant competition he's about to face uh, if he plans to start something on his own? Uh, Salil, do you, do, you, do you think we should use phrases such as winner takes all when we describe the fact that a handful of companies dominate India's market cap and profitability? No, in a way, you know, there is a, a natural evolution that way. So, I mean, I would think that uh, the way to perceive this is to actually say that you are going to be the one uh, with your enterprise, with your business, that you're going to be the one consolidating uh, businesses rather than getting demotivated. Uh, at least I'll think of this as a motivation tool. Uh, should I be the one building the she company and being uh, amongst the top 20? Uh, but this is a natural economic phenomenon. So I don't think there is anything... Uh, uh, anything which is wrong in that. Uh, and like, you know, Gopal sir has already said a couple of times, right? Uh, both are possible. You can build a she company and you can be a great, long-lasting, profit-making, uh, return-generating business. But can I offer a suggestion to you guys in the context of the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go, on, uh, go on, Gopal sir. Go on. Uh, in the context of the question that has just been asked, I do believe that philosophies and beliefs of people get translated into words. Long, long ago, uh, 35, 40 years ago, 
we were going to launch some soap or detergent or something or the other in Hindustan even. And the marketing department came up with the metaphor of war. Okay. And they said there were bombers and there were all sorts of missiles flying in the air saying we'll kill the competition. Our senior manager at that time, who was a sort of general sales manager, he said, if you're going to run this audio visual to motivate people, you might succeed. But I'm not coming for your conference. So he said, why, sir? He said, you're selling soap, damn it. Don't use metaphors like war and killing people. So I would ask you to consider whether it's essential or is it just dramatic? And if it is dramatic rather than essential, then are there other ways to make the drama? Sure. No. That's a point of view. Because when we, you know, I don't know if you remember, I think it was the Olympics in 1996 uh, in some yeah. city where Atl Nike, Atlanta. Atlanta, Nike wrote yeah. this hoarding, you know, you don't lose gold. Uh, what is it? You don't lose, uh, uh, you don't, uh, if you don't win gold, then you've lost everything. Something like that, you know. Something which made you feel that you're, if you don't come first, in, so it's like a parent telling a child, if you don't come first in class, then you're useless. You can't get into IIT or your life is finished. So using those kinds of expressions is perhaps something worth a reconsideration. Uh, nicely put. Nicely put. I was, I was just going to sort of finish the uh, uh, finish the session by saying that if you look at this list, right? If you look at this list of companies, uh, you know, this is this is the these are the twenty companies that have generated the most wealth in the last twenty years. Last ten years, I'm sorry. The twenty companies have generated the most wealth in the last ten years. Yes, there are some crony capitalists on this list, uh, but there are there are out of that twenty, there are several companies that have been created by very hard and women who've done the right thing, uh, uh, built, built great businesses, employed uh, millions of people, uh, created products which which uh, define all our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And as I was saying a half an hour or so ago, most people have no idea who's built these businesses, right? So if I take, say, uh, Bajaj Finance, and if I asked people on this call, does anybody know what's the name of the man who works? I think he works six days a week. He works 12 to 13 hours a day. He's got a bunch of colleagues who work just as hard. Um, uh, Rajiv Jain used to be my neighbor till 12, 13 years ago when he moved to Pune and built, built uh, with, uh, with the Bajaj family, with Nanu Pamna, the late, great Nanu Pamnani sahab. He built one of the great franchises in corporate life. Uh, I don't think Rajiv, uh, Rajiv cares about which award he's getting. Uh, 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 he cares about building a a lasting business a franchise which defines uh, NBFC lending. Similarly, if you if you look at uh, uh, Infosys, uh, uh, I don't think Salil Parekh uh, uh, spends time sort of uh, uh, garnering media attention or uh, caring about media attention. Uh, ever since uh, Salil Parekh took the helmet Infosys with uh, Nandan Nilepani uh, uh, sir as chairman, uh, the company has regained its uh, former glory. Similarly, if you go down the list, uh, Amit Singhle at Asian Paints and the team uh, that works there, indeed Asian Paints is previous CEO, KBS Anand sir, uh, and going back the last six years of Asian Paints. Uh, these are companies built through immense amounts of hard work. They have generated, as I said, Asian Paints 23,000x of value creation. Our country, by and large, today is not characterized by crony capitalism. The crony capitalist is the aberration. He or she is not the norm. The norm in India increasingly, the norm in India increasingly, and almost all the wealth in the stock market increasingly is created by she companies. It's just that because, as Gopal sir said right at the outset of the meeting, right at the outset of the webinar, because the she company is so undemonstrative, so uh, 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 non-show off, non-show off oriented, that that aspect of Indian capitalism gets underplayed, and unfortunately, all of us end up thinking that somehow crony capitalism defines our country and our society, and that is actually not the case. So, thank you very much, Gopal sir. Thank you for for giving us uh, books that we can learn from, and for giving us a mental model of the sustainable, honest enterprise, a mental model that we at Marcellus hope to to work with and do something with it, so that. Uh, 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 the, the, this whole construct you're creating uh, endures and defines India in the decades to come. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you and a great thank pleasure you. talking to you and Salil and thank you to your audience who joined this session. Bye. Thank you. For, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.